Our text today is from the Gospel reading. And mocking him, they said, he saved others. Himself he cannot save. <clears throat> Countless artists have tried to paint for us the scene. Those three crosses silhouetted against the sky on that hill far away. But even the best of them have never done it justice. They wouldn't dare. It's too terrible. And even if they had, we couldn't stand the sight of it. But there's another painting popular in recent years. Perhaps you've seen it. It's not the sight of Jesus on the cross. It's the sight that Jesus saw from the cross. What was going on on Calvary? Not from our viewpoint, but from his viewpoint. And that scene is even more frightening. To the left and right, he could see the two others impaled upon the wooden beams. And at his feet, the soldiers whiling away the time drinking cheap wine and gambling for the victim's clothing. Beyond the area they had cordoned off stood the people, conspicuous among them the chief priests in their resplendent robes and their colleagues, the religious Levites. Out on the perimeter stood the women from Galilee, huddled together, helplessly looking on. On the roadway far below, pilgrims passing into the holy city for the festival, some of them hurrying on because they didn't want to be involved Mothers shielding their children from the ghastly sight. And some of them stopping out of morbid curiosity. It's the crowd that is most chilling. A while back, there was a two-car collision right out here on the intersection. No fatalities. But one of the vehicles did end up in the front yard of the parsonage. The woman, a middle-aged driver, couldn't get out, felt that her ankle was broken. And a gash on her head had matted her hair, and the blood had streaked down her cheeks. What I remember is how quickly a crowd gathered. Not from the neighborhood in large numbers, gaping and staring at that helpless woman. It wouldn't have surprised me if somebody had started working the crowd selling popcorn and souvenirs. I've read that people will come from far and near to witness a hanging, and I believe it. But the one thing no artist, no painting can ever do is reproduce the sounds on that hill. I've been to more than enough deathbeds in homes, the hospitals, and even if the dying person was a no-good rascal, the atmosphere is always subdued. Voices are hushed in the presence of death. But not here. They're jeering at the top of their lungs. They're taunting a dying man. The text tells us, they that pass by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, come down from the cross. They wag their heads. A gesture of shame on you. An expression 
of no to everything Jesus was and did. You've heard the words before, however. They are casting Christ's own words back in his teeth. The first time Jesus came to Jerusalem with the twelve, he fashioned a whip out of leather thongs, trashed the tables of the money changers, and threw the whole bunch of them out of his father's house. Outraged by what he had done, the religious leaders confronted Jesus and they challenged him, give us a sign who gave you the authority to do this. You want a sign? I'll give you a sign. This sign. Destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it again. They never forgot it. Later at the trial, uh, they accuse him. This fellow said that he would destroy the temple made with hands and in three days he'd build another temple not made with hands. That wasn't true. Jesus never said he would destroy the temple of God. He said they would. But they garbled his words to make out like he was some mad terrorist about to blow up the temple. Oh, but now you find out they knew full well all along what Jesus was talking about. Now they are destroying the temple of God. And they are defying him to do anything about it. Aha, they said. Aha, it's all over now but the shouting. And so they supplied the shouting. Now, if the ballots were all counted at sundown, they would be right. But you've got to be careful measuring God short term. Because all the votes aren't always in at sunset. And you don't have to change these words one bit to hear them every single day. You live in a generation of Americans who laugh at the teachings of Jesus. They defeat the claims of Christ by what? Majority vote. Everybody's doing it now. Haven't you heard? Times have changed. Well, depends on how you mark time. Funny that they remembered the first part and forgot about the last. This ain't the third day. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. And then they said something else that you have heard before in the story. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross that we may see and believe. They didn't realize who they were quoting. Someone else said those words first. The devil did. At the temptation, right at the start. If thou be the son of God, and it sure don't look like it. I mean, here you are hungry, abandoned out here in the desert. If you're the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And again, if you are the Son of God, jump down from the pinnacle of the temple. Give the people what they want. Bread and entertainment. Don't come around with this agony of Gethsemane, the way of sorrows, the piercing of thorns in a crown. People ain't into repentance and suffering and self-sacrifice. And now in Calvary, they're saying the same thing to Jesus to abandon his mission, disobey his father, and leave the children of men right where they're at, without peace, without pardon, and without hope. What if he'd have done it? What if Jesus would have stepped down from the cross, gone back home to Nazareth, lived out his days, 
and died peacefully in his sleep in bed. Well, you and I wouldn't be here today. Jesus held to the will of his father, and by the way, your father, and canceled out the debt, paid the full price to destroy forever the power of the devil and death and hell itself. Now, Satan couldn't keep Jesus away from the cross, so the only thing he's got left to do is to keep you away from him, blinding you to the meaning of the cross, deafening you to the claims of the cross, dulling your soul to what the cross always calls for. Now, that cross is a mystery, and I cannot explain it, but it's only part of the mystery. Remember that. After the cross comes the crown. After the gritty part comes glory. And on that third day, after death comes life eternal. And that good stuff. And then the chief priests. These are the guys who know the scripture, who are custodians of the faith. They say, he saved others. Himself he cannot say. These people should have known better than anybody all about saving and being saved. It was the sole point of their existence. To lift up the eyes of people to the God of our salvation. But they couldn't conceive of anybody losing his life in order to save anybody. The only standard they lived by was save yourself, think of yourself, God, you owe it to yourself, be good to yourself, find yourself, fulfill yourself, and develop yourself to your full potential. And so they mean it as a terrible put down. Ha, he saved others himself, he cannot save. Hey, he had saved others. He saved Simon the fisherman and Matthew the publican and old Nicodemus who came to him by night and that woman by the well at Samaria and Zacchaeus perched up there in a sycamore tree and Mary imprisoned by seven devils in her own body. He saved the widow's son at Nain from a sleep from which no one ever wakes. And the twelve-year-old daughter of Jairus. And Lazarus, four days dead in a grave. Jesus said, it's the thing. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He never used his awesome powers to advance himself, assert himself defend himself, or save himself. That's why he saved others. They had it dead right. He saved others himself, he cannot save... Uh, no, exactly. Precisely. Jesus said it's a law of life. Whosoever seeks to save his life is going to lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And you will find that principle, and I don't care where you go. Your home, your relationships, your job. You want to talk about uh, 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 rearing kids and nah, 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 nah. No, he's telling you. Father Damien went to the Polynesian island of lepers because he said, Christ Jesus said, preach the gospel to every creature, and lepers are God's creatures too. But by doing so, he pulled shut the lid on his own coffin. He saved others. Himself he could not save. In a church on our eastern seaboard, there's a plaque to a lady by the name of Edith Evans. 
a passenger on the Titanic who gave her life jacket and her place in the boat to somebody else and she went down to a watery grave in the North Atlantic. She saved others. Now you tell me, how could she save herself? The president awarded the Gold Coast Guard Medal posthumously to Arlen D. Williams, Jr. A few years ago, when that jetliner crashed in the Potomac River, Williams was the guy out there in the river handing the helicopter lifeline to others who were bobbing in the icy waters. And when the chopper came back for Williams, he was gone. Well, you tell me. How could he have saved anybody else if he'd saved himself? Edith Evans, Arlen Williams, are fools among America's me first generation. But what they did will always be heroic and Christ-like as long as their names are remembered. On how many battlefields hasn't the same scene occurred? Some guy given up his life so that in how many homes hasn't some gifted person given up a career, a chance to become somebody important in this world because of the little ones and the weak ones and the aged ones who needed him back home. You remember it as Jesus is telling you, such losing is not loss. In his company, sacrifice is never a waste. And dying, going to do it anyway. Dying is not defeat. It's the key to your life. Full and abundant life, life unending. Whosoever loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Amen. The peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.